Good day. I wish to uh, talk to you this afternoon and today, uh, for those who are just watching it, um, about Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Of course, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics is one of the most significant texts you will have ever encountered. If not in ancient philosophy, um, that will be true also of your encounter of it in, um, in uh, ethics, um, but also in ancient philosophy. And uh, that will tell you that the first two books uh, will play a very important role in your ethical formation. And uh, for that matter, I'll ask you to read and go back to the first two books. Now, eventually, uh, you will see the importance of these books, especially if you studied uh, Thomas Aquinas or if you are familiar with the uh, Thomistic principles that somehow, in one way or another, uh, argued for the sumum bonum. Uh, but, uh, but Aristotle's greatest contribution, we need to understand, is uh, on the fact that he's able to provide an ethics that is based not on external laws, but on habit. No? Uh, so let's look at uh, Aristotle's work. Uh, the nice thing about this edition is that it will provide you the subject of the inquiry, the nature of the inquiry, what the human good is, and the like, and the kinds of virtue and uh, so today, allow me to talk about book one no? uh, and try to expand on book one. And I will upload the second video that discusses book two. No? I don't mean to be exhaustive in my discussions, but only clarificatory at least. No? And um, this is book one and chapter one, no? the subject of our inquiry. I will use the annotating uh, portion or dimension of um, Zoom to allow me to give emphasis to the things I want to point out. The first thing I want to point out is the first sentence. It says, every art, every inquiry, and similarly, every action and choice is taught to aim at some good. What does that mean? Every art, every inquiry is always already directed at a degree of goodness. Uh, that basically means that all things, no, every is uh, quite undermining, uh, but uh, every literally means all. All things are, I mean, every art, every inquiry, ev all the things that we do is always already directed at some good. When you say all the things that you do is always directed at some good, that basically tells you or it provides you the idea that everything that we do, no, every choice that we've made is always done with a view of a certain good as an end. No? Um, when we look at it from that perspective, we come to a point wherein we realize that even smoking gives me pleasure or gives the smoker pleasure. Even... Uh, other actions that, that are not always understood uh, provides a certain good to a certain somebody. And because of that, there's always already, whether you like it or not, an appreciation of that good. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, uh, then we need to reevaluate really what Socrates is uh, trying to understand. You know? uh, and and Socrates is saying everything that we do is always directed to a certain good. And that means all that we do is always directed to some good. However, he also tells us, as we move further, that there are certain goods. So everything is directed towards some good, but there is a difference among them. Because the difference is found on the fact that some are just ends, whereas some are just activities or means. Which means, while all things are always directed at some good, we need to understand that some goods are goods because they are a means to an end. And some things are good because they are ends in themselves. You study philosophy in order for you to graduate, for example, and have a degree. That's a means to an end. Um, but you study, if you study philosophy for the sake of studying philosophy, then it becomes an end in itself. That's the distinction. So he showed to us that, for example, 
the goal no uh, that there are many actions and and that tells you also that the ends are varied no the end of medicine is health of shipbuilding of having a vessel of strategic victory of strategy victory and of economics wealth and because of that you need to understand that there are many different types of goods therefore that we need to consider some of these goods are ends in themselves other goods are means means and because of that they should not be treated in the same way now uh, after having clarified that everything is an uh, that everything uh, everything possesses an end no so let's look at that um, uh, let's no take note of that everything uh, is always directed towards a particular good uh, no uh, everything is always directed towards a particular good uh, but as i said a while ago uh, do not be uh, confused because the word every uh, in a way no undermines the fact that all things no all actions uh, are always directed towards some good that's what aristotle is saying right uh, but not only that no aristotle seems to be creating the distinction between goods that are understood as ends in themselves and goods that are understood as means to an end no so some are means uh, others are ends in themselves no uh, and and we need to understand that while some are means and some are ends it seemed like for aristotle there's still a hierarchy among these ends such that means are actually lesser compared to ends uh, because the means are only stepping stones to arrive at an end there seems to be an appreciation of one over the other. Now, uh, let's go back to the text and see what his chapter 2 will say. When you look at chapter 2, you'd realize he'd say there, if then there is some end of the things we do, which we desire for its own sake, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, clearly there must be a chief good. So there he says uh, beautifully, that, uh, that because there is, seems to be a hierarchy in terms of the ends that we, we aim at, the more important thing is that we need to aim at the chief good, right? And then he begs the question, will not the knowledge of it then have a great influence on life? Shall we, not like archers who have a mark to aim at, be more likely to hit upon what is right? If so, we must try in outline at least to determine what it is and of which of the sciences or capacities it is the it is the object so he says we need to aim at the chief good but we do not only aim at the chief good we need to also understand what art will lead us to it closely and the art that he mentions is this no in this part and politics appear to be of this nature now, we need to understand why is he saying that political science is the art that actually aims at that good here. Political science, sorry, uh, let me get a clear straight line. Uh, political science, he says, politi uh, sorry. political science then is that which aims at the chief good. So, um, we need to clarify that a little bit. And let me go back to my whiteboard uh, to, to make that claim. Wait, let me clear first everything. Um, close this one and then uh, go to my whiteboard. There. So he tells us that uh, we, we, since he was able to identify that there are ends, then there must be an end uh, that everything is uh, interested with, the highest good, the chief good. And remember, there's a hierarchy of goods that he's talking about. Now, this chief good that he's talking about here uh, can be understood, he said, by a very unique, very particular discipline. And the discipline he lays down is not ethics, but he, he calls it political science. Um, I think it's political science. Uh, 
please uh, take note that by political science is not actually referring to political science, the discipline as we know it right now. But I think we can get an idea from that. Remember, political science is the field that basically study the polis. It seemed like for Aristotle, being good uh, is always already or should always be understood in the context of the polis. Why? Why is that so? Because before, if you do not live in the police, uh, be, uh, you are either, there are only two things, you're either a beast, that's why you, you do not belong to the police, or you're either a god. Uh, and because you're either a beast or a god, you do not belong to a police. It seemed like uh, being good uh, is only possible in the context of the polis, because it is only in the polis that we understand what it means to be human. No? And here you see a social dimension to, um, to uh, Aristotle that it seemed, the way I understand it, uh, and if I hope you don't mind uh, why I'm explaining it this way, um, tells you that uh, to be good, to be human for that matter, is uh, possible only um, when not, you're neither a beast nor a god. No? And therefore, being good um, uh, is a context uh, in the context of human relations. And that's the reason, I think, why there in chapter 2, he did argue that there is a chief good, but not only did he argue that there is a chief good, he also argued that it can only be done in the context of the Polis. Let's go to chapter 3. No? And there in chapter 3, he clarifies what this science must uh, possess or the three things that the science must possess no? or qualities that the science possess. And the very first thing that stri uh, strikes you when you read this one is the fact that this science doesn't aim at any precision, no? which tells you already that it is not a precise science. When we say that it's not a precise science, that's of course similar to saying that uh, it's not going to prescribe one way of doing things um, in the same way that mathematics uh, does, no? uh, because it's not concerned with calculative action or with mathematical action. So please take note of that. No? It is not a precise science. But wait, there's more to clarify, no? Uh, he says that for one, it's not a it's not a precise science, and for that matter, each man judges well the things he knows, no? And so he says, uh, the a person who is educated in the subject is a good judge, and for that matter, he says, uh, in this case, he says the young man is not a proper hearer of lectures of political science. So he says, if you're too young, you're not a very good uh, candidate for listening uh, about this lecture. Why? Because he says, for a young man is inexperienced in the actions that occur in life, but its discussions start from this and are about this. No? Ethics, as he says, is not actually simply about uh, theory or concept, but it's basically about life. And therefore, it will necessitate a particular understanding, a particular disposition to life, which he says is necessary if you are to understand the ethical life. But he also says, and this is the second point that's worth underlining, uh, that this is important because the goal of ethics or the goal of political science, as he said, is not knowledge but action. No, uh, the goal is not simply to know the good. The goal is to be able to do the good, and it's very important that a person who who is ethical knows that. And he says, and it's also worth reading, that it makes no difference whether he is young in years or youthful in character. The defect does not depend on time, but on his living, pursuing each successive object as passion directs. And he has a term for it the incontinent. He says, if you're incontinent, the knowledge brings no profit to you, but to those who desire and act in accordance with reason, knowledge about such matters 
will be of great benefit. And that's also something that you have to consider, no? Uh, the incontinent. He's not, he does, an incontinent is a person who basically focuses on, uh, focuses on his desires and who simply falls victim to his desires. And he says a person who does ethics, um, that's problematic, no? That's really problematic. So let's let's uh, clarify that a little bit in our diagram to show uh, what the science and, and, and entails. No, so first there are three things that we said we should consider whenever we are studying uh, ethics, and that's stated in chapter three. One that it's not a precise science, uh, and when we say it's not a precise science, we're actually saying that. Uh, it's not mathematical and therefore it's not only it's not calculative. Second, um, the, uh, it, it's not for the young uh, because uh, the young are victims to their passion. They're technically incontinent. No? And remember, even Paul in his letter to the Romans speaks of incontinence when they, he says, I do the things that I really do not want to do. And, and that's something that you have to pay attention to uh, because it clarifies to a certain extent uh, what, what, what Paul is saying in that letter, no? that I know the good, but I don't do it. I am a victim of my passions. And the third one is that we say that the goal is not knowledge. No, sorry for that. Uh, uh, let me... The goal is not knowledge. Uh, but action. And therefore, you need to understand that uh, the field is not really interested with do with knowledge alone. No? Uh, I don't know how to... It's strong spelling uh, there. Uh, uh, you need to understand that it's not enough to know uh, what is good and what is evil. More important for Aristotle is the ability to live it out. Now, after giving his three warnings about uh, what this science is about, Aristotle continues in the text to describe what the field uh, he's trying to investigate is. No? And here he says, let us resume our inquiry. No? Uh, there was a digression. He start, talk, started talking about political science, and now he wanted to clarify it again. He says, let's resume our inquiry and state in view what that what is that good which everybody pursues? And then he says, quite interestingly, he says here, when you ask uh, what people want verbally, he says, there is a general agreement. Everyone agrees. And he distinguishes between the two, the general run of men, the hoi polloi, the people, and the people of superior refinement. You know, the philosophers, that's how he will call it. No? Uh, like me, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, and he says, when you look at the general run of man, the general population, and when you look at the, the philosophers, people of superior refinement, everybody's in agreement that it is happiness. So he's saying, everybody, don't you see it? Everybody wants to be happy. And, and that's also something that we need to pay attention to. So uh, Aristotle is saying, when you look at that chief good, no? when you try to understand what that chief good is, it seemed like uh, that chief good uh, is in fact happiness. Of course, the Greek word is more important and the Greek word often or loosely translated as happiness is in fact eudaimonia. And when you dissect the word eudaimonia, you, good, daimon, spirit, uh, it's the situation, experience brought about by the good spirit. No? That's what it means. That's why eulogy, uh, EU, logy means good words when somebody dies, right? However, uh, he says there's an agreement between the general run of man and the people of super re re superior refinement as to what it is. Uh, it's happiness. But what constitutes happiness, uh, people don't often agree, he says. So that here you would see uh, the general run of men, uh, the crowd, the many, if I may use the term of, uh, of Socrates, and the people of superior refinement, um, 
which uh, basically means uh, the philosophers, and I'm not kidding when I said uh, a while ago, I'm the model. I'm really kidding. No, I, I'm not the model philosophers. Uh, but I hope you see the refinement. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sobra na. Baka sabihin wala. Uh, but, uh, but, but there you see uh, also uh, how the, 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 he says, uh, when you look at the general run of men, And if you look at the people of superior refinement, there's no agreement really as to what consists of happiness. Uh, although he would say there in the remaining sections of chapter four that people actually have varying ideas about it. Others look at it in terms of pleasure, wealth, and honor, although people differ in terms of how they understand that. Uh, but he says, uh, we'll consider and see more closely what it means. And then he says, for Plato, uh, it's really about first principles. And there you see the distinction between the people of superior, superior refinement, uh, Plato was the example that he used. And on the other hand, he will give the example of uh, the many. And he says, uh, let's look at the many first. No? And that's chapter five. He says, when we look at the many, we realize that me people think it's a life of pleasure, life of honor, and life of wealth. What do we mean by life of pleasure, life of honor, and life of wealth? He says, when you look at people who live and think that it's simply a life of pleasure, you'd realize that uh, pleasure is fleeting. Uh, it's, it's not permanent. Uh, and because of that, you, you might think it's addictive, but it's incomplete. The same is true for a life of honor. Remember, honor must be given to you. People have to be clapping at you. And because of that, you might think that it is already sufficient, even if in reality, it's not. And, uh, and the more important point to consider here is the fact that he says the problem with this one is that they're really not complete. And when I say not complete, I mean uh, the in and by itself, it's not actually the source of happiness no but but they are a means to happiness we see the logic more carefully in the last paragraph of this section and uh, that is worth uh, putting in a red box for you and here you'd see uh, he says the life of money making is one undertaken under compulsion and wealth is evidently not the good we are seeking for it is merely useful for the sake of something else and that's true also for pleasure Uh, that is fleeting, temporary, and the life of honor, no? fleeting and temporary. He says the life of money is not, is not is useful, yes, but it is, we want to be rich in order for a, us to be able to do something else. We want to be healthy in order for us to do something else and things like that. And so one might rather take the aforementioned objects to be end for they are loved for themselves, but it is evident that not even these are the ends, yet many arguments have been wasted to support them. When we look at it from that perspective, we can go back to our drawing board. Um, and when we go back to our drawing board, we'd realize we can clarify that a little bit further. No? Uh, in a new box, uh, you see that according to the general run of man or to the hoi polloi, as I was talking about it a while ago, um, happiness is in fact concerned with uh, what I, kill, I would call uh, pleasure or health, the life of pleasure or health. Sometimes we wanted to be healthy, especially now that there's a pandemic. Um, the life of honor or fame, no? uh, and also wealth or money-making. And uh, accordingly, as I've shown to you, Aristotle said that even if people agreed that this is actually a happy life, uh, we need to be able to distinguish the fact that, that these are fleeting lives. And as such, because they're fleeting, they do not actually constitute what a happy life is. For that matter, uh, he, in the succeeding chapter, he will try to address the life as it is suggested by the philosophoi or philosophos, which is uh, Plato. No? And when you look at that chapter on Plato, you'd realize that he started talking about doctrines and ideas and things like that. And when you look at it from this perspective, you'd see, why is he talking about ideas, Pythagoreanism, Tohen, the one? 
And by the way, uh, the name Spusipus is something you have to take note because Spusipus is the cousin of Plato who, who eventually inherited the academy um, and, 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 and Aristotle hate uh, to a certain extent. No? Uh, um, it's sad that, that, that the academy went to him no? because Aristotle is the brightest of all students. But uh, accordingly, what you need to take note is the fact that it seemed like for him the good is ideal, no? that it's simply ideal. And it is here where you will see the criticism of Aristotle um, to his teacher whenever, when he says, and let me put that also again in red box for you uh, here, he says, it is hard to see uh, how a weaver or a carpenter will be benefited in regard to his own craft by knowing this good itself. Or how the man who has viewed the idea itself will be a better doctor or general thereby. No? Uh, will that make me a good person if I simply know the idea? Will it, will, will, if I know what it means to be good, is that enough? That's the question that is confronted here. For a doctor seems not even to study health in this way, but this, the health of a man. Or perhaps rather the health of a particular man. It is individuals that he is healing, but enough of this topic. What is he saying here? He seemed to be saying, what is the use then of trying to know the idea of the good if you cannot actually live it out? Are wars won only because you know the idea or you have an idea or not? And, and somehow that's also interesting to consider, right? Because if we look at it from that understanding, uh, he seems to be criticizing his teacher on the fact that the teacher seemed to push forward, Plato, I mean, seemed to push forward an idea of a, a mere idea. And for him, the idea of happiness is not the same as actual happiness. I can, uh, and, and, and that's where he says uh, the, the, the two, the general run of man and the people of superior refinement do not seem to provide or are able to provide an answer to what constitutes happiness. So, so far we're done with a few uh, paragraphs and allow me to continue clarifying the succeeding paragraphs. It is here that we see um, the criteria that he provides to the good that he's seeking. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it's very important to, to understand this one. No? I'll pause it for a meantime. I'll just address something. Thank you. Let's resume. So um, we, we were a while ago before I went on a short break, but you might not have noticed because I paused the recording. We were talking about the criteria of the good as it is articulated by Aristotle. And here we are looking at specifically uh, something, uh, the good that we are seeking, he says. For one, he says, the good that we are seeking should be in itself final, which means it's the end uh, there uh, that, that we are seeking. And when we say it's the end that we are seeking, uh, that, that means uh, we're not seeking anything else. Once we get it, that's it already. That's the first thing that you have to consider. The second thing that you have con to consider is that he's saying that not only is this final here, there's a asterisk, sorry, that the chief good is final. He says that the chief good should also be um, self-sufficient. Um, which basically means I should the self-sufficiency here is that I'm not seeking happiness for another, but that in itself it is self-sufficient. So there you have it, two characteristics about what uh, it should be. One, it should be final. One, it should be self-sufficient, which is the same as saying that, that it should be an end in itself. In fact, he will even say uh, at a latter part here, that it should be experienced here. Uh, uh, I jumped a little bit, but I will return to the succeeding uh, lines afterwards in a complete life. No? Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and the succeeding lines is a, is, is a very beautiful line for me. And I love this a lot. Uh, this is a quotable quote. For one swallow, one bird does not make a summer, nor does one day. And so to one day or a short time does not make a man blessed and happy. That's also beautiful. Doesn't really matter. Uh, that uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, but let's go back to, 
to the diagram that we're forming. And you'd see there that, uh, so it says, if neither of these constitutes the chief good, what is the characteristic of the chief good? And as we've said, it has to be final, which means it has to be complete. Um, it has to be self-sufficient. That means it's not dependent uh, on anything else. And lastly, it has to be experienced in a complete life. No? And, 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 and that's the criteria that he basically provides um, in order for us to capture what, uh, what, uh, what that happiness is. Now, let's go back to the pages that we skipped because we need to see uh, something else there. No? He seemed at this point, uh, seemed to argue that happiness uh, is therefore here, uh, is something final and self-sufficient and the end of the action. Now, speaking of end of the action, he says, uh, is it possible that other things have functions uh, and things have purposes uh, and uh, everything has a purpose except man? And, and this is where you see his reasoning, no? uh, which people will call teleological, but it's not always teleological. No? And, and let me uh, put that in, in red box here. He says here, this might perhaps be given if we could first ascertain the function of man. He says, if we're able to identify the function of man, uh, then we are able to clarify uh, what we are going to uh, talk about. No? Uh, uh, talk about. Um, for just as for a flute player, a sculptor, or an artist, and in general for all things that have a function or activity, the good and the well is thought to reside in the function, so would it seem to be for man if he has a function. But do men have a function? He goes to the next one. He says, have the carpenter then and the tanner certain functions or activities and as man none. No? Lahat ba may function except man? Uh, is he born without any function? Or as eye, hand, foot, and in general, each of the parts evidently has a function, may one lay it down that man similarly has a function apart from all this. So he says, uh, te, uh, that's understood as telos, no? teleology. That's a type of ethics that uh, uh, Aristotle pushes forward. And telos means far or purpose. Uh, television means far vision. Telescope means far scope. Teleology is uh, a way of acting, doing, with the end in mind. That's why telos logos, right? The logic of the end. That's why uh, uh, this type of ethics begins with the end in mind. And the end in mind that it pushes forward is the end in mind for humans. He says humans have functions. And if we are to understand our functions, then we'll also understand where we're coming from. Somebody's calling on the phone. I'll just pause this one again. Okay, sorry, I have to talk to our secretary uh, and uh, I need to clarify uh, a few things. So uh, we move now to, uh, to our discussion uh, about what is proper to man. And here we see the three things that uh, has been clarified already, uh, that we need to clarify. You know? And uh, let me take it from there, he says. Life seems to belong to plants, but we are seeking is peculiar to man. So if it's simply a life of nutrition and growth that is present in plants, and therefore that's not something unique to man. The second one is life of perception. And he says that's also shared with the horse, ox, and every animal. And therefore that's not what is proper to man. And therefore he will arrive at the element of reason because for him uh, it is this that makes man rational and therefore he has he says and as life of a rational element that's the one that we need to pay attention about let me diagram that as we go back to the diagram uh, uh, that i was making since a while ago no so so he says therefore that uh, if this is the criteria then we need to look at something that is peculiar to man and in that case, he's talking about the function of the human person. 
And whenever he starts talking about the function of the human person, there are three things that he is also considering. No? And there are three things that uh, is worth considering. The first thing is, he says, the life of nutrition and growth uh, is not what is proper to man uh, because uh, even animals have, uh, even plants does do that, no? nutrition and growth. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so life of nutrition and growth. Uh, and, and he says, uh, uh, if your dream is only to grow muscles or to become a hunk or, or if, you're, if, you're, if your dream is only to eat mukbang mukbang, uh, that's, not, that's not proper to man because even plants are capable of doing that. Um, and the same is true for the life of perception and pleasure because he says uh, even, even animals are capable of a life of perception and pleasure, no? And you know that, no? Uh, even, even animals indulge in sex. Even animals indulge in uh, other things. And if you simply understand yourself, no? Only in terms of that, uh, you miss the point, no? And that's why he says, uh, uh, the one that really makes man what it is, is a life that has a rational element. And this rational element is very important because it's the rational element you'd see that, that, that clarifies in one way or another uh, what is nature to man, natural to man, which therefore says, uh, he says, if there is something that is proper to man, if there's something that really makes us human per se, uh, really human, then, uh, then it, it has to be and it must be, uh, whether you like it or not, something related to our rational faculty. Of course, what he meant by the rational faculty um, is something that uh, that you need to consider also. No, uh, but let's let's move forward first and analyzing what else he's talking about in the succeeding pages, so that we can be clarified about what else uh, is there. No, so uh, so I, I like the succeeding lines when he says. Uh, this serves as an outline of the good, only an outline, no? Uh, for we must presumably first sketch it roughly and then later in details. Um, and, and that's also something that uh, we need to consider whenever we are looking at uh, happiness, no? Uh, and then uh, in, in the eighth, he was looking at uh, happiness per se, and he was looking at whether happiness is determined by external factors or elements. Um, what must be clear here is that uh, he describes happiness to be attached to what he will call virtue um, or arete there. Uh, we those who identify happiness with virtue or some virtue, our account is in harmony. No? That means um, he's actually going to talk about happiness that is always already attached to a virtuous life. You know? and, uh, and he says here, their life is also in itself pleasant. To live a virtuous life is also to live a pleasant life. No? Pleasure is a state of the soul. And to each man, that which he is said to be a lover of is pleasant. No? If you, and, and that's something that you have to pay attention also. That's why he would say, if this is so, virtuous actions must be in themselves pleasant, but they're also good and also noble. Now, uh, there are questions whether external goods are part of what it means to be uh, good. And it seems like for Aristotle, that's also true. No? Uh, you'd say he's elitist, but uh, this, uh, this is also worth reading. No? He says, yet evidently, as we said, it needs the external goods as well. For it is impossible or not easy to do noble acts without the proper equipment. In many cases, he says, and, uh, and you'd, you'd be able to see, um, in many cases, and, and you can clarify this here, of course, uh, uh, in many actions, we use friends and riches and political power as instruments. And there are some things, the lack of which takes the luster from happiness. No? It takes the luster from happiness. Good birth, goodly children, beauty. For the man who is very ugly in appearance or ill-born, or solitary and childless is not very likely to be happy. And perhaps a man who would, who would be still less likely if he had thoroughly had bad children or friends or had lost good children or friends by death. No? 
So he says, uh, happiness seems to need this sort of prosperity for which reason some identify happiness with good fortune. In a way, he's saying, uh, pag pangit ka, if you're ugly, it's not possible for you to be absolutely happy. Uh, to a certain extent, no? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's true also. No? And it is here where he says uh, that uh, whether it is a consequence of learning or habit or sent by the God, I leave chapter 9 for you to read. But there you will see that it's an exercise of the soul. No? It's an activity of the soul. And, and, and that's also very important. Um, and, uh, and here in this section, should no man be called happy while he lives, he says a uh, person precisely becomes happy in this life. Uh, and the example that he provides is that of Priam, no? And uh, because is Priam blessed or is Priam happy is a question uh, that he's trying to clarify. So, uh, and then he says virtue, therefore, is something that, that has to be considered. Uh, and here he starts looking at the type of virtue, no? Uh, and how, where does that type of virtue come from? It, type, it comes from the type of soul, uh, the understanding of the type of the rational element, right? Uh, because he says, if the human person is really constituted by the rational element, you need to understand also that there are two rational elements. No? And, uh, and what are the rational elements for him? On the one hand, he speaks of the other one as Sophia, intellectual virtue or inte theoretical wisdom on the one side, and then on the other side, he calls it phronesis. Uh, and phronesis is actually practical wisdom. Uh, so that there is a theoretical reason, uh, the reason that makes you know things, and there is practical reason, the reason that makes you do things. And each of these will provide a different type of virtue or arete. And you'd see eventually that the arete that we will look at, moral virtue, in the next lecture is a one that is a consequence of uh, of uh, of uh, practical wisdom no? of practical wisdom i'll end the recording there and here uh, the next time we see each other i'll start discussing book 2 thank you very much <laughs>